3 of 2 Kings 7, reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. And this is a unique question that they speak out. Why should we sit here waiting to die? They asked each other. We will starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender to the Armenian army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. You can't lose. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Armenians. Armenians. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Armenian army army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sound of a great army approaching the king of israel has hired the hittites and the egyptians to attack us so they cried to one another and they panicked and ran into the night abandoning their tents their horses their donkeys and everything else so they fled for their lives when the lepers arrived at the edge of the camp they went into one tent after another eating and drinking wine and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it They were looting. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. One of them had been to Sunday school. They said, this is a day of good news. We aren't sharing it with anyone. You You can make a margin there and say good news is meant to be shared. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeepers what had happened. We went out to the army and camp, they said, and no one was there. The horses and the donkeys were tethered to the tents. Everything was in order, but there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the good news to the people in the palace. Father, thank you for the beautiful opportunity to speak your word today. I never take that lightly. We ask you to cultivate our hearts, get us ready to hear a word from you. We know we, we, we want to do church with you in the center. You are the center of it all. As pastor preached last Sunday, just you, just Jesus. There's no name like your name. We sang it to you today. There's no power like your power. And at the name of Jesus, every tongue is going to confess and every knee is going to fall that you are Lord of all the earth. So today we lift our hands willingly and we give you praise and glory and honor. Let the church shout amen. Amen. Turn to someone before you're seated. Say you look really Canadian today. I want to speak to you on the topic this morning, the X factor. The X factor. For those of you that are not avid TV watchers, this is now a popular program on the television where you have four judges, I believe it is, and they sit in front of a stage and people come out with a talent, singing, magic, or some type of talent, and they perform their talent to these judges, and if the judges don't like what they're doing, they hit a button, and essentially what they're looking for, the, the, the premise of the whole show and the reason they call it the X factor is the judges are looking for that specific factor in the person that is performing, that, that X factor, that unknown, that thing. Some people call it the it, the it factor. You have it. Have you ever heard someone say that? You have it. The people that have it don't know where they got it. And those that, that don't have it don't know where to get it. It's just, it's it. So I want to talk about that this morning, the X factor. We're going to do some math and some equational breakdowns, if we can, to figure out what exactly is the X factor when it comes to an awakening, a revival, a renewal. Uh, What is the variable? The Internet, and it's got to be true because I read it on the Internet. The Internet gave us this definition of the X factor. It is a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on the outcome. I'm going to read that again. The X factor is a variable in a given situation that could have the most significant impact on the outcome. So there are many different variables today that we've gathered. You got up, you showered, some of you showered, the rest of you, we know who you are. Just joking. 
Maybe you brushed your teeth. I don't know what, what your, your morning routine was like. You had to get into your vehicle. You drove all the way here, and we're disappointed that Pastor Ed isn't here any longer, and you had to look at my ugly face. But we came for Jesus, and you came to worship and lift his name on high and celebrate Canada and thank God for freedom, the ability to do this. So all these variables play a part, but I think the, the biggest variable this morning is Jesus. That's why we're here. So so many so many different variables. Not that other variables don't matter, but there is the variable that has the most impact and is his name and his glory is the reason we're gathering this morning. So I want to go through some variables. I've really this is not just an average message. I, I, I want I don't want you to feel that I'm recycling any messages. I've never preached this message as I was preparing and I had like a whole month of not preaching, which was fantastic because that hasn't happened in like eight years. So I really enjoyed that, and I began to, three weeks ago, I began to pray and say, God, what do you want me to speak in July as we kick this series off? And he caused me to go back over my life and just look, look back and say, if there is a factor, if there is a science you could break down to say, what causes a move? What causes God to walk into somebody's life? Is it just providence? Is it just chance? What is the X factor? What is the common denominator? What is the variable, if you will? If you start studying moves of God and awakenings and people having miracles and signs and those that live a spirit-filled, God-filled life, what is the variable? What is the common denominator in all these stories? So I begin to go through different options, and I want to I walk you through that with me today. Is that all right? Amen. For two people, it's all right. Say, is that all right? Say amen. All right. Calling, number one. Obviously, the, uh, the big, big thing is calling. In fact, Jesus walked past some men fishing in a boat, and I love the way he interviewed his employees. He, he didn't say that dreaded question that people ask in an interview, which I can't stand. Where do you see yourself in five years? And you're, 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 you're applying to drop fry buckets at McDonald's, and they're asking, where do you see yourself? What does it matter where I see myself in five years? I'm, I'm here to flip burgers, obviously not here. I don't know how many people are saying, in five years, I want to be flipping these burgers. It's probably just a temporary job. You want to move on to something else. But he didn't even have an interview. He walked past his disciples who were fishing in a boat, mending their nets, rather, and Jesus just gave them two words, follow me. And, and this is what the scripture said. And immediately, they dropped their nets, and they walked after Jesus. It takes a whole lot of guts to do something like that. So obviously you have to be called. God has to call you and draw you. The scripture says you can't even come to Christ without him drawing you. That's why I need to pray for, for our loved ones that don't know him, that God would put in their heart a desire to know him. I always pray over my children and say, God, plant in their heart a desire to know you all the days of their life. And when they stray away from you, let them be so discouraged and so unquieted in, in, in their spirit that they have to walk back to you. We need the calling and the drawing of God. In fact, this is such a factor in our mathematical equation this morning, is if it wasn't for calling, I wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for calling, you wouldn't be here. It's a big factor. It is a big factor. I believe very strongly that there is, I've said this before, that there is a spiritual appointment over Bethel. I would not be here if I didn't truly believe that. That it is the time that God wants to do something with Bethel Community Church to reach the city of Winnipeg. I wholeheartedly believe that the call of God is on us so we take calling divided by 12 disciples times the square root I was homeschooled so we're not really going to do math because nobody would fall there's a reason I'm preaching and I'm not a math mathematician okay you do the equation and we're looking for the x factor x equals what is the x factor is it calling well if you times it by Judas it's not because Judas was called, just like the rest of them. In fact, there were some other people in the Gospels that Jesus said the same words to. He, he cried out to them, follow me. And they said, well, let me first go bury my father. Let me first get my business in order. Let me first do this. And he said, you're not even worthy to be my disciple. So calling in itself, on its own, calling, just calling as an equation, is not enough to be the X factor. 
I know many people that were called that never went. I know many people that God drew and they never repented and they never responded. So calling is a huge factor. I don't want to take away from it this morning, but it is not the X factor. So moving on, number two, is it qualifications? This is a big one. This is a factor. Is it qualifications? Well, if we look at many people in the scripture, one of the ones that come to mind right away is King Saul. King Saul was the first king over Israel. Up until that time, the nation of Israel were ruled by judges that God would raise up and they would judge the land and when that judge would die, Israel would backslide. So they desired a king and God said, really, that's not my will for you, but okay, you get a king. And when they were picking the king, the scripture says that King Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. So it would be very easy to identify who this man was. Now, back in that time, that was an immediate qualification to put yourself into a rank or a position that you were just big. Wouldn't that kind of be nice? All of our politicians, just if they're tall, you get in. Thank God that that didn't happen. Or else I'd never stand a chance. Five foot eight. With my heels, maybe five foot nine. Well, King Saul was so qualified that he was a man of battle and of war. And there came a time when a giant called out to the army from, the, from a valley and said, come and fight. And all of Israel is hiding in their tent. Now, the Philistines throw out a threat and a challenge. And they said, you send out your biggest man your strongest warrior, and we'll send out ours. So Goliath of Gath is standing over nine feet tall, declaring who's going to fight and challenging the army. Who was the most qualified to fight that battle? King Saul. The scripture said that he stood a head and shoulders above everybody else in Israel. King Saul was a tall man. He was appointed and called and qualified to fight the giant, yet he didn't. Little shepherd boy, 15 years old with a tiny little bit of hair on the top of his lip. You know when a 15-year-old grows a mustache, you know what that looks like? It looks like a caterpillar crawled up there and died. Yeah. That's what King David looked like. Or King, yeah, David. He's not a king at this time, he's just a shepherd. He gets up there. He is probably on paper the least qualified to fight this man. He's never held a sword, never been in battle. He's just picked up sheep manure. He's got a shepherd's staff. He's got a sling and some stones. And he stands in front of a giant and declares the name of the Lord and throws that stone and the giant crumbled in front of him. So obviously qualifications is a factor, but it is not the X factor. It's not the X factor. Your resume your charisma, your knowledge are all important things, but they are not the thing that God is looking for. These lepers that we read about in 2 Kings, it's interesting. Four men that were diseased were not even qualified to be in the city. They couldn't even be around people. They were isolated and put out. Does anyone ever know what that's like to be on the outs and not on the ins? Have you ever been on the outs? And there they were standing at the gate of the city, unqualified and uncalled. But they had an X factor. And the third point that I want to make, and we're cruising right along, is experience. Experience. Time and an encounter with God. I believe that an encounter with God is very important. I, I believe it is such a factor that my mind started racing, I thought, this is it. This is the X factor. Because you see people that just don't really get it, but they've never really had an encounter with God. And you know those people that have just had an encounter, and you know that they've encountered something. The scripture said of the disciples that the learned people said, I don't think they're very learned and educated, but one thing I can tell is that they have been with Jesus. It matters the experience you have. It matters the experience you have. Experience is important. 
An encounter is important to have an actual God encounter for yourself, not live off of your parents or your grandparents. Or I need an encounter of my own with Jesus. Somebody say amen. So maybe this is the X factor. If I poured over it in scripture, started to look for maybe there's some holes here. And I, I realized that experience was very important. Many people in the scripture encountered Christ. In fact, Christ was so attractive, was so attractive that crowds followed him. But the closer that he got to his actual God-given destiny, the thinner the crowd got. So you can't, you can't look at your social media page and look at the friends you have going for coffee with you and judge whether or not you're doing a good job. You can't look at how many people are giving you a like or a thumbs up or saying you're doing awesome or whether or not you're fulfilling your God-given destiny because sometimes your destiny will lead you to a cross. Sometimes your destiny will lead you to a lonely place, a place where all forsake you and no one believes in you and you stand alone. Don't be surprised when God's destiny in your life leads you to a place of loneliness. And he stands at this cross and hundreds have experienced a miracle. He's fed 5,000 people before their eyes, John. He takes a piece of bread and breaks it. And in front of their eyes, two fish and five loaves feed an entire multitude of people. 5,000 people witnessed that miracle. He rode into Israel and they laid palm branches before him and shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And a few short days later, that same crowd was yelling, crucify him. Crowds are fickle. People are fickle. So, an experience and an encounter with God is not the X factor. Because if we fast forward after the death of Jesus, the birth of the church and the day of Pentecost, there was only 120 people in the upper room waiting for him. Of all the things he said, of all the miracles he did, of all the prophecy, there was only 120. There was only John at the cross and his mother and Mary. You can't look at experience as an X factor. In fact, Paul, or, uh, returning to King Saul and King David, King Saul was so much more experienced. He had slain giants. He had slain some, uh, um, killed thou hundred thousands of Philistines and or hundreds, and, and, and David wasn't experienced at this time, but, but he had that X factor. He had that spiritual component. So as I begin to look through the scripture, I, I realized that some people had experience, and that was, the, that, was, that was good, and some people didn't, so that wasn't the variable in the scripture. I looked at calling, and some people were called, and some people weren't. So that wasn't the variable in the story. I looked at qualifications and I realized that some people were really qualified to what God called them to do and some people were just not qualified. But there was a theme in the entire scripture where I see where God would be present in somebody's life, where God would do a move, where God would do a miracle, where God would intimately be a part of somebody's life that was there in every story that I looked at. And I, and I realized that this was the X factor. And this is the X factor for us this morning. As we enter into this new season, as we go through transition as a church, as you personally step into your season that God has for you, this is a factor that we must pray for in our hearts. And this X factor I want to talk about this morning is hunger. There is no substitute for hunger. If I look throughout scriptures and every awakening that ever happened, hunger was present. King David wasn't qualified and he didn't have experience, but he was hungry to fight a giant. And these four lepers, if we look at their story, they weren't the qualified people to go out and have a, have a talk with the Armenian army. They weren't called. They weren't put in a position of power. But there were four men that were so hungry that said, if we stay here, we're going to die. And that type of hunger, God cannot resist. There was a woman at a well that was so thirsty that Jesus said, guys, I know we've got to go this way, but I have a need. i got to go to Samaria because somebody is hungry. When we get hungry for God more than for anything else, God cannot resist 
to do something miraculous in our life. In fact, Matthew 5, Jesus gave us a promise. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In other words, God is giving us a promise, and he's saying, I will be as big of God to you as your hunger can be big. Don't insult God with small hunger and small dreams. If you're hungry for it, God can fill your hunger. His word says so. If we hunger for God to, to reach our loved ones, if we hunger for God to move in this city to bring people to Christ, if we hunger for God to expand our borders and to draw us closer to him, church, I've come with some good news this morning. God will meet you in your hunger. There is no hunger that God won't meet you. The X factor. Four guys is hunger. Saved the entire city. I'll say it again. Four people were so hungry, they saved an entire city. The entire city, the next day, had so much food and so much plenty, they didn't even know what to do with it. Because somebody was so hungry that they made a statement and said, if I stay here, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to quote Pastor Rocky Balboa. All the 80s children. It's not about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you get hit and you keep moving forward. Right? Anyone know Rocky? Rocky 3, which is like the best of the Rockies. I think there's like 20 of them. I think I stopped watching after number three. I think it's Clubber Lang or someone that he's up against. And Mickey, remember Mickey? Mickey. Rocky, you ain't hungry. He said, this is trouble because this kid is hungry. He's a wrecking machine and he's hungry. Uh, he ain't no, but no, no fighter. He's just another fighter. Hunger is dangerous. Have you ever hung around someone that is extremely hungry all you married people have you ever seen your spouse very hungry you could say the wrong thing and meet Jesus <laughs> it happen when you're hungry things happen yeah. if I look at the stories in the gospel I got a woman with an alabaster box. You got a woman with an issue of blood. You got a short little tax collector that climbed a tree. You got 5,000 people that Jesus interrupted his sermon for. He said, they're so hungry, I can't send them away. I am obligated to do something because they're hungry. You've got a woman with an issue of blood that pressed through a crowd just to touch the hem of his garment. You've got a blind man that was willing to interrupt an entire meeting and say, Jesus, have mercy on me. You've got four friends that are willing to tear a roof off of somebody's house and lower their friend down because they were hungry. Jesus is required to move when you're hungry. I've noticed something about hungry people. They're not picky. I am a father. I have two children, and we we go through. We go through. I, I promised I wouldn't sound like my dad, but the older I get, I'm sounding just like my dad. My mother, I remember, I used to hate roast beef. Now I love all food. Now, all food, pretty much. Besides sushi, anyone that eats sushi, you need prayer. It's raw fish. Even Jesus cooked the fish. So the other day I was having a conversation with our 10-year-old, now 11, as of this weekend. And he was, we were talking, and he said, Dad, I'm hungry. And I think we had some leftovers of some sort, and I can't recall what kind of food. And I said, we actually have something from lunch. I can just heat it up for you. And he said, no, thanks. I said, well, you ain't hungry. Well, I would like some candy. No, you're not hungry. You're not hungry. 
hungry people aren't picky. When you get hungry and desperate enough, it doesn't matter what song they're singing. It is, you don't wait for your turn. Oh, they're singing my jam. Yeah, that's my song. Young people, it doesn't matter if it's a wooden pew and a hymnal. And it's amazing grace. When you're hungry, God will meet you there. To the older generation, it doesn't matter if it's lights and smoke and, and whatever cool song they're singing now. If you're hungry, God will meet you there. It's not about the variables of everything else. It's about our hunger. And if we get hungry enough, God will meet us there. The worship young will meet old. It's a beautiful thing to turn around. Sometimes you watch me when we're worshiping, I just turn around and stare at you. Because it's what heaven looks like. All sorts of different colors and backgrounds and, and a bunch of hungry people. That that hunger draws you together. I felt that during the worship today. There was a moment where you could tangibly feel the hunger in the room. That we called out for God. I do know this. That God hasn't given me a 40 point plan for the next year. But he did tell me. We need to start out by declaring the power of hunger. And he said, if, you, if you'll get hungry, I'll do something. And you'll eat whatever the Lord has for you when you're hungry. The psalmist said, one thing I've desired from the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The psalmist also wrote, as the deer pants for water, so my soul longs for the presence of the Lord. I, 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 I'm hungry for a lot of things, but, but I'm hungry for the presence of the Lord in my life more than I ever have before. And many of us are been filled, and we look back over our life, and I, I personally have seen God do some amazing things that I've hungered for and God has fulfilled, and I've seen the power of hunger where it can take you. My father was not a not born into a preacher's home. He wasn't a clean living man. He was a bushy mustache. Like, I'm not talking about these, these caterpillars that died. I'm talking about a soup strainer. He used to keep a whole meal in that thing for later. I'm talking a mustache. He was a trucker. He always had the dirty jokes and the rude, crude comments and the bad words. and It's a tough... Never saw him cry. Never saw him show emotion. He was so wounded. Facade. His mask. He had been excommunicated from the Mennonite church and was so wounded by religion and he believed there is no God. He lost his children from his first marriage and he stood on a riverbank with a gun on his head and said, God, if you love me, give me my children back. He lived such a reckless life. And then when I was 10 years old, I watched him encounter Jesus. And no one can touch you like Jesus can. No one can change your life like Jesus can. And then I watched an unqualified, maybe not called, I don't know, man with no experience sell everything we had and planted churches church after church after church and gave his entire life for the gospel's sake yeah and 14 years ago i graduated high school i think it's right around there and college and all this you know it's a crazy age and i remember digging my face into a carpet and i said god there's a lot of people that are more qualified than i am there's a lot of people that are more experienced, that have a pedigree and a resume and education. But Lord, there's no one more hungry than me. And God made me a promise. And he said, if you'll stay hungry, I will fulfill every hunger you have. If you'll hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I've watched hunger take me at a young age to places and 
that I never dreamed I'd be and sit in rooms with men and women that were world-renowned that mentored me and poured into me and just God set up the right things at the right time because I'm looking back at it all and realizing that the X factor is are you hungry? As an employer and many people in this room that are in management or in employee, employers or business owners, you can get a stack of resumes for people that are qualified. There's tons of people coming out of school that are qualified. But what are you looking for in an employee? You're looking for someone that you don't have to push. You're looking for someone that's hungry, that'll get up in the morning and do their job. You look for, at the musician that's, that's that much more excellent than the rest of the musicians. What pushed him to the next level? Hunger. There is no substitute for hunger. I mean, stand with me as I close. Play, we're going to pray as a church. We're going to kick off this summer revival with a repentant heart. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. What is that? That's getting hungry. When you're hungry enough, you'll dig through a trash bin. When you're hungry enough, you'll eat sushi. I remember being on an extended fast one time and sushi looked good. I thought, man, I'm starting to get delirious. Something's going wrong. Hungry people, it doesn't matter what song they're playing. It doesn't matter what you look like. Your soul just cries out. And as I was preparing this message, I was reading over my notes last night. It had been a busy week. We're moving and getting all, living out of boxes and I'm laying in the bed and reading the, the message notes. And the Lord just spoke the word spiritual anorexia to me. So I began to study what anorexia is and what kind of disorder and how that works. And anorexia is an interesting um, disease or situation. What it does is it makes you believe you're full. It makes you think that you're not hungry. And meanwhile, people die 80 pounds, 70 pounds, and they wither away believing that they're full. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, how many of my people think they don't need any more? Like, Jesus, I've already experienced you, and I've got my family, and, you know, i got my finances in order, and everything's just hunkadory. And then you watch a sinner that's life is broken apart, you know, get on their knees and say, God, I need you. I, last night I said, Lord, I don't need you to rip my life apart for me to know how much I need you. I don't need you to take things from me for me to realize how blessed I am. I'm hungry. I've got an appetite for you. So with every eye closed, and if you would, lift your hands. If you don't want to, that's cool. I want you to pray this with me. Father, thank you for this church. That, that I'm here this morning. Awaken my hunger for you. Jesus, we need to move. We don't want to sing our songs, take our offering up, and go home for the, for the year. We don't want to do that. We want to see people that are far from you come into an experience and in an intimate relationship with you. We want to see loved ones, but people that have turned their back, those that have been called and are running. We pray for a hunger inside of them to awaken Lord we may have material things but let us really take an inventory of our spirit today now some of us have hungered for you and we've experienced your presence and it has been a long time since we've been hungry prodigal son spent his inheritance made a lot of bad decisions didn't make his dad very proud and the scripture says that when he spent all his money and it and in Luke the, the 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 writer Luke describes it like this that when when the son came to himself when he awakened 
because he was eating what the pigs ate. He was so hungry that he said, even my father's house, the servants ate better than this. And it was his hunger that caused him to run back to the father. And some of us in this room, it has been a long time since we've been hungry for a move of God because we've already been hungry and he's touched us and he's done those things. But church, I wanna, I wanna challenge you to dream. I wanna challenge you to get hungry for, for the next thing. I want you to, to challenge you to get hungry, to run back to the arms of the Father. And I promise you, he's not gonna meet you with contempt. He's not gonna have a list of things that you did wrong. He's gonna run out to meet you. There's no one in this room that's too dirty, too filthy, too unqualified that God can't move in your life in a powerful way. I've sat in rooms, hundreds of couples that my wife and I have counseled and had the privilege of speaking into. And I've sat in, in rooms and watched that in their eyes, there is all the ingredients to make a marriage work, but they're not hungry. And I'll tell you what, if I can see hunger, it doesn't matter how kind of broken marriage it is. If there's hunger in their eyes to make it work, it'll work. I wonder if the Holy Spirit isn't just walking through this room right now looking for one person that would say, God, I'm hungry for a move. I may be 80 years old, but I, I don't think my best days are behind me. I believe my best days are in front of me. I don't believe Beth, Bethel's glory days are not behind it. It's in front. Amen. This generation is going to encounter God just like the generation did before it in a powerful, real, intimate way. How many believe that? I want to see a move with this generation. I want to see young people, young adults, intimately fall in love and get hungry for God like they never have before. In the name of Jesus. And as a church, Lord, we repent before you. We pray. And as we sing and as we worship, close this out. Fill our hearts with hunger this morning. Hunger that we would talk to our neighbors. Hunger enough that we would fall on our knees, not out of duty, but out of delight. That we'd be mindful of you in our drive to and from work. That you're just so intertwined in our life that we meet the Monday Jesus, not the Sunday Jesus. In the name of Jesus, let's sing.